Hello. I hope everybody is enjoying themselves um, and relaxing some this summer. Um, what I'm sending you, uh, myself, uh, Mr. Bruce, and Dr. Chu, um, put together um, some writing prompts, um, some different reading options, and then ultimately um, designed some math problems. Um, the first set of math problems are very open-ended, logic-based problems. Uh, then the second part is um, model drawing specifically designed per grade levels. But what I'd recommend is that, you know, I'd love to have the children try to at least set up all the problems if they can um, with the model drawing. Um, but just recognize that in terms of the, the math piece, obviously the, the bar keeps being raised um, as they go through each section. And then the last part of math is designed specifically per grade level. Um, for some different skills the kids want to um, continue to work with um, entering their specific grade level for next year. So um, enjoy this opportunity um, you know, to do some, some enrichment uh, this summer. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to Mr. Harrison at gharrison at sasaustin.org or to Dr. Chu, which is jchu at sas.org, um, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. In terms of some possible solutions for the math, I will be sending that out uh, later in the summer because I'd love to have the kids have an opportunity to explore it on their own and or with peers um, and or with their siblings um, or parents and really focus on the process and see you know, what are some of the different solutions they can, they can come up with uh, along the journey. But enjoy your summer, have fun, and we'll catch up with everybody soon. Thanks. Hello, I wanted to send you the, so, some of the solutions to the math packet uh, that many of you worked on this summer. Um, and continue to enrich yourself and um, think logically a, about math. So uh, let's look at the first one. Um, I noticed as I, as I talked to a few students that the first one became a guess and check problem. Um, let's look at it a little differently. Let's look at it more as a pattern. Um, if I look at the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and I say, well, wait a second. If I notice that 1 plus 5 is 6, 2 plus 4 is 6, that leaves me with the number 3. So 3 must go in the middle. So we could do 5, 3, 1, 2, 4. Then hopefully we recognize that, well, that's not the only possible solution. There's many solutions. We also could say that 2 plus 5 is 7, 3 plus 4 is 7, so that can leave us with 1 in the middle. So that's our leftover number. We also could say, well, wait a second, we used up the number 1. Hmm, is there anything with this? 1's an odd number, 3's an odd number. Wait a second, 5's an odd number. So could 5 be the middle number for the next one? Well. If we look at this, we notice that 1 plus 4 is 5, 2 plus 3 is 5. So we could have 1 and 4, 2 and 3. So then we add these numbers vertically and horizontally, they all give us the same solution. Now, as we move to the bike shop problem, I personally think setting this up as a table is the easiest way to do this. It's not the only way to do it, but I think it's easiest, so you're not guessing and checking. So if I had 10 tricycles, that would be 30 wheels, uh, then I'm going to have no bicycles. If I had 8 tricycles, that would be 24 wheels, so then I need 6 more wheels, that would be 3 bikes. Well, if we start to notice something, there's a pattern that's forming as we solve this. So if you notice, on the top, Okay, if we look at every two tricycles, you know, so we went with 10, then we said, okay, well, let's look at 8, let's look at 6, let's look at 4, 2. So the trouble is if we only have one tricycle, that's an odd number of wheels, and there's no unicycle we could use um, to, be, to be looking at as a sale item in our bike shop. So then with, tr with bicycles, we're counting every 3, so 3, 6, 9, 12. So then we know that here, well, if there's 15 bicycles, that's also 30 wheels. Now, the Anna problem um, in relationship to 37 cents. I'm only going to give a couple of these. There, there is multiple, multiple um, possible solutions here. But again, setting up as a table, 
So I know I have a penny, I have five cents, I have 10 cents, I have 25 cents, or I have a penny, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter. And when I start to break this down, well, to have 37 cents, I know I'm going to always have to have two pennies. And I could keep writing two pennies multiple times. But wait a second, if I had two pennies and seven nickels, I don't need to have a dime and a quarter to have 35 cents. If I have two pennies and five nickels, well, I'm going to have to have one dime to make 35 cents. If I have two pennies, three nickels, that gives me 20, wait a second, that gives me 17 cents. So then I'm going to need two dimes. Again, no quarters. So, as again, as we start to look at these different combinations, there's ultimately multiple more ones you could come up with. As we look at our product problem, we have to remember product is two numbers multiplied together are 96. So if I think of the factors of 96, so I say, wait a second, let's create a factor tree. So we say, okay, what times what is 96? So remember, two whole numbers. So we know that 1 times 96, but the trouble is, wait a second, their sum has to be less than 30. Well, 1 and 96, if I add those together, that's 97. That's not less than 30. Wait a second. What about 2 and 48? Hmm. That's 96, but it's not less than 30. What about 3 and 32? What about 4 and 24? So look at 6 and 16. Look at 8 and 12. So, wait, 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 wait. I know that 4 and 24, that's a solution, right? That could be two, the two of the numbers, because that's less than 30. We know 6 and 16 is less than 30. We know 8 and 12 is less than 30. So, as we look at um, the number 5, I only did obviously two rectangles. There's, I would love to see the number of different rectangles that <clears throat> children came up with, um, especially if they're willing to use fractions. I mean, obviously, it becomes an endless number of possibilities. But you know, so I did one rectangle where if we had dimensions four by eight, so that'd be thirty-two square units. That'd be a perimeter of twenty-four units. Um, I did another one well, that's two by sixteen. That'd be thirty-two square units as an area. For the perimeter, that would end up being thirty-six. Um, for number 6, draw and label a quadrilateral has a perimeter of 48. <clears throat> so if we have a perimeter of 48, well, if we add up 16 plus 8 is 24, 24 plus 24 is 48. Okay, there's our perimeter. What's the area? Well, the area would actually be 128 units squared with that one. Again, multiple different solutions. Number 7 is interesting because number 7 really piggybacks off, if we remember correctly in the first problem, the odd numbers were the numbers that we end up sharing. And so if we think about sharing... Um, we can think about putting them into these into these categories because those are shared numbers. So if we let 4, 6, and 2 not be shared because they're even, but if we allow ourselves to say, well, wait a second, we can share 1, 3, and 5. So if I know if I did 4, 5, and 2, that gives me a total value of 11. If I do 2, 3, 6, it gives me a total value of 11. If I do 6, 1, and 4, it gives me a total value of 11. And that's, that's one possible solution. Um, my question would be, is that the only solution? Okay? For number 8, um, I apologize. I, I think it's a little confusing. When I say that four people can sit at one table, what I'm referencing here is the idea that we would have somebody seated on each side of the table. So that when two tables are pushed together, it would look like that. So if, if you did not recognize that, please, please um, stop this now um, and go back and, and try to solve number eight. If you did recognize it this way, then obviously there's no reason to stop it and we can go on to look at the solution. So as we're looking at the solution, I might just say and set up as a table. So I said, okay, table, T, P, people. So one table holds four people. Two tables hold six people. So if I said to you, how many tables must be placed together in a row to seat ten people? Well, I said, okay, well, here's ten people.
sorry. So we know that 4 tables seat 10 people. Then we know that 20 people, so we go down and we say, well, wait a second, we finished our table, we know where 20 people takes 9 tables. Now, if we said if tables are placed here in the row, how many people could be seated using 10 tables? Well, 10 tables would have 22 people. Now, if we kept this chart going, we know that 15 would seat 32 people. Uh, number 9 is an interesting one, because what I love about it is, although it's not written out as a model drawing problem, it, I, I think it's easiestly solved as a model drawing problem. Lisa... Julia, Julie, sorry, and Tom. So we know that each one of them, and remember with model drawing, we each start with a unit bar that's comparable. So <clears throat> Anton would like to know their ages. Tom gives him the following information. He says, I am seven years older than Julie. So Tom is seven years older than Julie. Lisa is nine years older than Julie. If you add our ages together, you will have my mother's age, which is 40. So what I like about this is it's just organizing our information. So we know that we have three ages that we start, we have three boxes we have to fill because we're not sure. So we're saying, well, that's 16. So if we take 16 away from 40, that leaves us with 24. We're dividing 24 by 3 because we have three boxes left. So that means that's 8. So if we allow each one of these to be 8, then we know that our ages are. So we have an age for Lisa of 17. We have an age for Julie of 8. And we have an age for Tom of 15. Um, I find as I do the single file line one, um, or any problem of this nature, I like to, you know, same as if you think about probability problems, they play out this way too. We're saying, okay, well, what? Well, I know I have seven people that are lined up. And right off the bat, they tell me there's two children between Charles and Danielle. So I'm like, okay, well, wait a second. I have to make sure there's always two spaces. Okay, so I could have Charles and Danielle. Wait a second, I have to so, so for me, if I put Charles and Danielle like that, there's a trouble. That's not two spaces apart. That's only one space apart. So let's go back and say, well, wait a second. What if we moved Danielle over? And then we get to the next time. Say, Emil, the smallest takes the hands of Danielle and Francois. They're the same number of children behind and in front of Bernadette. Well, if there's seven total children, well, this is the middle most. We have three on either side, right? There's three there. There's three there. Then we say George is one of the children in line in front of Andre. So if Andre is in is here in line, and I'm assuming the line's facing this way. George is here. That's one possible solution. Um, out of curiosity, I would love to see if you got that solution, that's great. Um, I'd love to see is there another possible lineup that would allow all of these statements also to be true. Um, when I look at the problems like, like this, again, I think setting up a chart can be very helpful for the flower deliveries. So you just have a starting place. So we know we have we're talking about certain people. We're talking about certain types of flowers. So we have red carnations. We have yellow carnations. We have red tulips. We have yellow tulips. We have white daisies. I'm just going to write daisies because we only have one type of daisy. We know that Mrs. Dolan, so we have Dolan, Mrs. Culleton lives in Austin. Well, that's nice for Mrs. Culleton. Mrs. Hunt and Miss Ballin 
right, want yellow flowers. Mrs. Robinson and Mrs. Hunt want carnations. So let's go back and think about this. Miss Dolan only buys red flowers. So she can only buy either red carnations or red tulips. Then, Mrs. Colton lives in Austin. That's, that's irrelevant to us. We just know that she's getting flowers. It's really, we don't care. Mrs. Hunt and Mrs. Miss Ballon want yellow flowers. So wait a second. Yellow flowers. So Hunt... And Ballon want yellow flowers. Mrs. Robinson and Mrs. Hunt want carnations. Wait a second. If Mrs. Robinson and Mrs. Hunt want carnations, doesn't that help, help us start to realize the connection, the overlapping person is Mrs. Hunt? Because Mrs. Hunt wants yellow flowers and she wants carnations, and she only wants a yellow carnation. So we can safely say that the yellow carnation goes to Mrs. Hunt. And then from there, I would hope you could fill in the rest. So I want to give you a chance, if you didn't do it this way, to finish this off, and then I will give you the solution in a second. Okay, so as you start to break it down, hopefully you recognize that Miss Dolan's going to end up with red tulips, Miss Carlton will be the white daisies, Mrs. Hunt will be the yellow carnations, Mrs. Ballin will be the yellow tulips, and Miss Robinson will be the red carnations. Okay. Um, I went ahead and did out the solutions here. Um, the trouble with number 12, and, and this was not purposeful on my part, I apologize, um, is I know that we were briefly exposed to exponents and factorial, um, the third grade students were briefly. Um, the fourth and fifth grade students, you know, have, have definitely seen exponents and factorial. Um, so obviously for each group, um, you know, finding three solutions here might be a little different. I gave you four just to bring it to life. There's actually more than four. Um, but if you think about 7 plus 5 is 12, 3 minus 1 is 2, 12 times 2 is 24. 3 plus 5 plus 1 is 6, 7 minus 3 is 4, 6 times 4 is 24. Or we could say, well, 1 to the fifth power is 1, plus 7 is 8, 8 times 3 is also 24. Or if you think about 3 factorial, we know 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. 5 minus 1 to the 7th, well 1 to the 7th is 1, 5 minus 1 is 4, 4 times 6 would also be 24. So those are four different ways. Um, 13 is obviously going to be a different answer for everybody. What is the perimeter of your house in feet and inches? Um, 14, um, I kind of did it in two different ways. I mean obviously the red just says you had to know that there's 2,000 pounds in a ton. But um, I kind of looked at it and said, well wait a second, if we know that there's 400 pounds when the baby's born, well, then there's 1,600 pounds left to gain. Well, if we divide that by 200 pounds a day, that'd take us eight days. Or we could just write it out and say, okay, at the end of day one, we're going to weigh 600 pounds. Because when we're born, they're 400 pounds. We gain 200 pounds a day. So at the end of that first day, they will have gained 200 pounds. So 600, 800, 1,000, 1,200, 1,400, 600, 800, 2,000. So either way, you're going to get eight days. And then the last problem um, on this page, what is the greatest three-digit number? Well, we have to think about it. The largest digit we can put in the hundreds place is 9, so we want to be able to put a 9 there. Well, we only have left, you know, a 4, because 9 plus 4 is 13, and so 940 would be our largest three-digit number. Um, when I look at the year renting a car for three days, you plan to drive about 100 miles per day. The car costs $39 per day, plus 8 cents per mile, estimate the cost. You're estimating the cost because you're assuming you drive about 100 miles, that's the estimation part. So we know at $39 a day for three days, that's $117. We know if a car costs 8 cents per mile, right, times 100, that's only $8 you're spending on mileage. So 117 plus 8, so it's going to cost you about $125, assuming you drive the 100 miles. Um, number 17, an interesting thing about 17, I know I'm not, I didn't draw it to scale, it's not in inches, it's just me showing you something. If I go to draw a triangle, though, hopefully what you quickly realized is, if I have a side of 12, and if, and if my other two sides are 6 and 5, yeah, we can draw that, but, but the sad thing is, how is that true? Okay, and let me show you a different way to look at it. If you think about this side length, if we push this side length up, okay, and then we had that side length, so if this is 6 and that, well, 
let's put them in a straight line. There's our 12. If I put a 6 here and a 5 here, together that's only 11. That's not 12. So how can our two side lengths add up to a distance shorter than our than our hypotenuse or our, our other side? It doesn't have to, you know. So so that was hopefully something you discovered as you played around with it, that is you actually, if you had a ruler in your hand and you started measuring it, you found that, wait a second, my two sides have to be greater than my third side um, in terms of, you know, two shorter sides greater than the longer. So hopefully you figured that out. Um, I went ahead and finished off 18 and 19 for you to look at. Figure 18, a book is lying open on a desk. So I'm just imagining two pages of the book. The product of page numbers showing 930. What are the two pages? So if one page was 30 and one was 31, well, we know that 30 times 31 is 930. So that could be a possible option. For the cows and geese, I wanted to show you something. So if I purposely at first did it wrong. So I said there's nine cows and eight geese. Well, that's 17 heads. So the trouble is if I have nine cows, that's 36 legs. And eight geese is 16. So that's actually 52 total legs. Well, the problem told me that I would only have 48 legs. So well, wait a second. What if I only had eight cows? Well, that's 32 legs. And nine geese. So wait a second. If I did that, 9, 32, so that puts me at actually 50, right? Sorry about that. So that would be 50. So wait a second, let's try another one. What if we had 7 cows and 10 geese? Well, 7 cows would be 28, 10 geese would be, tw oh, there's our correct answer. So I actually I'm glad I I'm glad I retalked that through because I made a careless error. Um, when I, I know when I did eight times four for the up here and nine times two, I was saying that's forty eight, not fifty. Actually that's technically fifty. So the correct answer would be you'd have seven cows, ten grease, and forty eight legs. Okay, we're looking at number twenty, um, just to give you one idea. Um, you, know, you could say 99 plus 9 divided by 9, which is 1. That would give you 100. Um, I'd be curious to have you share with me you know, other things that you might have found that could have worked. Um, when we look at the um, students entering the 6th grade challenge, uh, the beauty of this is actually multiple ways you could solve this. I'm just giving you one possible solution. So if we say to ourselves, well, wait a second. 1 fourth plus 1 eighth is 3 eighths. 1 plus 3 eighths is 1 and 3 eighths. If we think of 3 fourths plus 1 fourth is 4 fourths, which is 1 whole. 1 half plus 3 fourths is 5 fourths, which is 1 and 1 fourth. 1 fourth plus 1 is 2 and 1 fourth. 2 and 1 fourth plus 1 and 3 eighths would give us 3 and 5 eighths. So, so that's just one possible solution um, on that one. Beautiful model drawing. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to walk us through to remember the steps of model drawing. I'm um, going to do the first problem at each grade level, and then after that I'm just going to show you the solution set um, for time reasons in terms of the video. So the first one, we want to read the whole problem. So Bo purchased five bags of cookies from the store. If each bag held 14 cookies, how many total cookies did Bo purchase? I recognize you don't have to use model drawing here. You could just multiply five times 14, but for pictorial representation, we'd be saying that we have Bo, and he purchased five bags. And we know that each bag held 14 cookies. So, if we think about it, we have 14 groups of 5, or 5 groups of 14, so that gives us a total of 70 cookies. Let's go ahead and look at number 2. Uh, Mateo and Luke fundraise for the school. Mateo fundraise twenty-eight dollars more than Luke, so they both start with the same unit bar. Right off the bat, Mateo fundraised twenty-eight more. If they fundraise seventy-eight dollars altogether, how?
how much money did each boy raise? Well, think about, so 78 minus the 28, so we have $50 left. That's $50 amongst the two boys, so that means each one of these unit bars has a value of 25. So we know that Luke fundraised $25, Mateo fundraised 53. Neat thing is about number three, so we have Hannah, Mila, and Helene. Hannah collected twice, so we all start with one unit par. Hannah collected twice as many as Mila. Mila collected twice as many as Helene, so then I had to double that. So once I double it, then we had to double Hannah's. Together they collected 35, so we find that there's a total of seven unit bars has to have a value of 35, so each unit bar must be five. So how much did each collect? So then we come back and say, well, we know that Hannah collected 20, Mila collected 10, and Helene collected 5. So as you look at this, um, what's neat about James and Milo is that they, James collected three times as many boxes as Milo. They collected a total of 44, so we know there's four boxes of 44, each one's 11. <clears throat> um, with the challenge one, the wording of the challenge one's key. If Kyle has eight more Nerf guns than Austin, we have to recognize that at this point, when they both have one unit bar, they have the same number of Nerf guns. So it's the two unit bars that represents the eight more. So then each one of those bars is four, so all the unit bars are four. We know that they had a total of 16. Um, the Mr. Harrison and Mr. Bruce, once Mr. Harrison gave away, so once he gave away two-fifths, so he gave away these two bars. Once he gave those two bars away, then they had an equal number. So they both, uh, Mr. Bruce only had three bars. But they started with 64 total, so there was a total of 8 bars when they started, and 8 bars have a value of 64, so each bar has a value of 8, so then we know Mr. Bruce must have had 24 cards. Now, Julia, Susie, and Sophia bought pairs. Julia bought one-third as many as Susie. So if they all start with a bar, Julia bought one-third as many, so that means Julia has one to Susie's three. But then Susie bought one-fourth as many as Sophia, so if she has three, then wait a second, one fourth as many would be out of twelve, because three twelfths is equivalent to one fourth. So we know that's a total of thirty two. And we find out that Julie Julia, sorry, would have two pairs. Susie has six pairs and Sophia has twenty four. So when we look at number eight, Alexander collects antique playing cards. He picked up one fifth of his cards in an antique store in Temple and one half of his cards in San Marcos. Um, to me, if uh, there's a couple different ways we can solve the problem, but if we allow ourselves to look at it with a common denominator of 10, we can say, that, okay, he picked up one-fifth of his card. So one-fifth, which is equivalent to two-tenths, he picked up an antique store. One-half of his cards, so one, two, three, four, five, five-tenths is one-half of his cards in San Marcos. The remaining 33 cards he got in Austin. So that means that each one of these has a value of 11. And so how many total cards did he collect? He collected a 110 cards. Um, as we look at number 9, you notice the difference in the wording. Because for 8, we had a reason to find a common denominator. For 9, it says, after giving one-third of his football cards to his brother, and two-fifths of the remainder to his sister. Well, let's think about this. So, first, we had three bars. One-third of them went to the brother. So, of the two bars left, we had to break that into fifths. So we broke that into two-fifths. Two parts of that went to the sister. Then we had 30 left. So, that means each bar was 10. So, that means this lower bar had a total value of 50. And that means each one of these bars was 25. So, we started with 75 cards. Number 10, Ainsley made $45. So she started with a total bar of $45. She put one-third in her savings. So we know that if there's three bars, each bar had a value of 15. So she put $15 in her savings. She spent three-fifths of the remaining. So what's three-fifths of 30? Well, if we break that into fifths, three parts of that. So each bar, each bar is a value of six. Three parts of that is six. So $18 she spent. Then the Luke and Jake, so Luke and Jake 
bought baseball tickets with two-thirds of their money. So two-thirds of their money with the tickets. They spent one-fourth, so one-fourth, so if we broke this up into the, as the remainder, one-fourth the remainder on popcorn and peanuts. So this one-fourth is what they spent on popcorn and peanuts. If the tickets cost $70, so those two tickets cost 70 so that means this is 35 this is 35 this is 35 How much money did they have left? Well, we have to think about it. So if 35 is broken up into four parts, well, each part is going to be... So when we think about the 35 broken up into four parts, each one of those bars is 875. But we got to remember, one of those things we spent, we, we bought peanuts and popcorn. So how much money did they have left? Well, they had three bars left. Each bar is 875, so they had a total $26.25 left. So, as we look at Bo, had $1,600. He spent three eighths, so we have eight unit bars. He spent three eighths on skis. One fourth of the remainder. So, what I, when I created a second unit bar because we had of the remainder, so we know we had one-fourth of that. So as we break it down, we find out that he spent a total of $600 on skis, $250 on gear, so he spent a total of $850. Um, there is 560 boxes of Girl Scout cookies that need to be sold. So of the 560, two-sevenths are Thin Mints, so that's 160. One-fifth of them are Tagalongs, that's 112. But if we add those together, that's 272. And we know that one-third of the remaining, well, we have 272 two cookies. Now, if we let them be the remaining cookies, okay, we find out that it would be 90 and two-thirds. What I'm hoping though is if you did something like this, you would say to yourself, wait a second, how can I have two-thirds of a box of cookies? So then we'd go back and say, well, wait a second, no, no. 272 was the total number of cookies between the Thin Mints and the Tagalongs. Wouldn't we have to subtract 560 minus 272? And that would give us 200 and... And then what's nice about that, if we think about 288, well, 288 divided by 3 would give us 96 in each box. So hopefully if, if you made that error where you took the 272 and you said, wait a second, I can't have two-thirds of a box, hopefully you, you double-checked yourself. Um, and then you find out, well, how many Samoyos do you have? Well, technically you have, you know, it's 288 divided by 3, so there's actually 96 Samoyos. Um, we know that two-thirds of Teddy's weight is equal to two-fifths of robbery, so we said two-thirds, so we created our, our, our thirds box, we're going to two, but two-thirds, so those, these two bars are equal to robbery's two bars, which is only, is out of two-fifths. So we find out that each one of Teddy's bars has a value of 40, that means Robbie's bars are at 40. So if we don't know how much does Robbie weigh, well, we know that Robbie weighs 200 pounds, because he has five total bars of 40. What's neat about the challenge problem is, is, is it really is a before and after problem, um, which truly really, to me makes it the challenge. It's not, I mean, it could be the ratio part, but to me it's more recognizing the before and after. So Ty and Harry collect Civil War books. Initially, Ty has six times when he's Harry, so Ty has six boxes, Harry has one box. But then after, Ty gives him some, so they have a ratio of nine to five. So if I allowed myself to break those initial boxes in half, so instead of Ty having six total boxes, he has 12, and Harry has just, instead of having one, he has two. Because then by having 12 boxes, it's much easier to give myself that ratio. Because if I gave three boxes away, that gives Harry five, and that leaves Ty with nine. And then we know that we say, well, okay, well, Harry, if Harry has five boxes, Ty has five boxes, there's four extra boxes. Ty has those four extra boxes have a value of 12, so each box must have an answer of 3. And then it allows us to break down the problem to find out that we know now that in this situation, it says, how many Civil War books did Harry have initially? So Harry had six books initially. 
then once he was given books, you know, we can answer that question too, but that's obviously not one of the questions that's being asked. The numeracy and computational um, strategies, I'm actually going to send this as a separate video um, because this, I just don't have enough space to be able to share multiple strategies with you. Um, so I'll be sending this as a separate follow-up video. Thank you.